Hello, hi. Um, we are on air. We are broadcasting from our Google Hangouts live on YouTube from the OHBM Open Science Special Interest Group channel. And I am really, really delighted to welcome anyone who's watching uh, and anyone who's watching live and anyone who's watching on the YouTube video after the fact to our very first, our inaugural demo call. My name is Kirsty Whitaker, and I am the president-elect of the Open Science Special Interest Group. And one of the things that I was really, really excited about doing was having you as members of the OHBM community learn a little bit more about some of the really, really amazing open science initiatives that have in the community. Ooh, I think who I might have just joined. Uh, we were having some some sound uh, challenges, but I think we're okay. I am going to I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm hoping that the demo calls will be, and then I'll stop talking. We're going to spend 30 minutes together. We've got three amazing guests, and we're going to spend approximately uh, eight to ten minutes with each of them. If you are online, uh, you can answer questions. In, you can ask us questions. Sorry, in the live chat on YouTube, and our wonderful moderator Elizabeth Dupre is going to sort of transcribe those across for us, so that we're not uh, trying to multitask too much. Uh, there is a code of conduct that's associated with these demo calls, so we ask that you um, remain kind and professional throughout. We really encourage positive feedback. We really encourage um, offers of support and suggestions and questions. Uh, please make sure to think before you uh, type and be considerate of all of our amazing guests. First guest, let's get started. Um, Alejandro, would you like to introduce yourself very briefly and tell us about your project? Sure. Uh, so I'm Alejandro de la Vega. Um, I'm a postdoc right now at the University of Texas, and uh, I'm working with Talia Arconi on this project called NeuroScout. Uh, so NeuroScout is basically, we're trying to make a one-stop shop for uh, fMRI reanalysis. Um, and so it's going to be a cloud-based platform for the flexible and like fast reanalysis of any open uh, fMRI uh, data set. And in particular, we're interested in uh, naturalistic data sets. So those data sets that have rich data, such as movies or audio, um, we want to enable researchers to be able to take a data set that's already out there, um, which is a problem that some people have already solved by having a lot of data set sharing. Um, but we want to make it easy to take that data set and actually reanalyze it with a novel hypothesis. Um, so that's basically the, the gist of it. Nice. And um, so that's the, that's the problem that you're, you're trying to, to solve. Can you tell me, um, I'm kind of curious, I'm going to jump in like at the deep end here. What's the yeah. hardest part of this, of this idea? Um, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of hard words, uh, but so one thing I alluded to, um, there's sort of two components, so I'll try to talk about the two parts of it, because it originally this project was really focused on, on the naturalistic data, and part of it still is, and but part of it is actually a more general tool that I think in the end people will be able to use to reanalyze any data set um, that is bids compliant. Um, so one hard part, but I guess also really fun part has been that this project really is relying on a lot of technologies underneath, like a huge stack of uh, bids and open technologies that enable data sets to be available for us in the first place, um, for the statistical modeling to be described in a way that's machine readable, uh, for you know having the Python tools to query those data sets and extract the information that we need from them, uh, to uh, you know actually uh, having a web interface for people to interact with with the data sets. So that's like a lot of stacks of technology. Um, and <laughs> Absolutely. someone who was trained, you know, in psychology originally, um, 
it's been really exciting and hard, but uh, really exciting to get to know all those levels of technology and to actually know that you know that knowledge of all those uh, languages is really what's enabling this and like the crosstalk between labs that are all specializing in one component uh, of the project yeah. that in the end is enabling our project to even work. So the idea is, am I getting this right? That like individual labs will have collected some really really amazing data and they will have had their particular question that they want to ask of it. And is the goal of Neuroskype to kind of like cross over those possible analyses with the with the different data sets? Um, yeah. Or are you hoping yeah. to sort of do something even more on top of that? So really the way to look at it is this. So right now on, you know, repositories like OpenFMRI, you have data sets available. So anybody can go and download a data set right now and say, hey, I'm going to reanalyze this data set. But turns out people don't do that as much as you think. So just part of the problem is getting people to share data. Uh, the other part of the problem is that, as you know, probably, like fMRI analysis is a lot of work. And so you might be committing several months of work to reanalyze a data set. And already people have this bias of, oh, I want to collect a novel data set. You know, I want to tailor my data set to my hypothesis. And so maybe this other data set that's already out there might help me with an initial, you know, like a pilot version of this testing this hypothesis, but it's going to be so much work, so I'm not going to do it. That's sort of the state of, of things right now. Um, but because these data sets are being shared in standardized formats, and uh, there's been work in bits to develop standardized ways to describe statistical models, uh, it could be easier to, to, to fit those models to these data sets, especially the, with the fact that there's uh, a lot of cloud-based uh, infrastructures like Open Neuro to execute those workflows. So the idea for Neuroscout really is to enable that model fitting step. Uh, so we have Open Neuro, which does the like execution of pipelines. We have Open, well, fMRI and Open Neuro that does the sharing. We have a lot of underlying tools that let us query it, like PyBids and uh, Datalad. But right now, the model fitting is still the really hard part. And we're trying to make it easier to, you know, so you can actually go to a website, select a data set, describe your model, um, and actually fit it in the cloud and maybe in just a few clicks and like an hour of waiting you have fitted results instead of two months. This is like one of my favorite things about the the potential for open source and open science projects like this is that what would have been you know legitimately three years of the first three years of a PhD project can now kind of become I don't know like a week like a bit of thinking about it, a bit of clicking around, a little bit of reading the documentation, a few hours on the cloud and processing and boom, you have yeah. your analyses. And my personal sort of what I get really excited about with that is that I think it will force scientists back into the thing that we're supposed to be really great at, which is actually coming up with the new ideas, coming up with like the better questions that we could ask of our data. Um, what is it that you get like really excited about with this project? What sort of, I don't know, like you're, you're working on it, it's hard, you've got all of these different moving parts, but what do you find most exciting? Well, first of all, you nailed it. So that's really like what's cool about this project is that it should enable uh, researchers to investigate new ideas, you know? So it opens up a whole world of things. So I think sometimes automation is something people think of as, oh, well, it's just saving us time, you know? But no, it's actually enabling a whole new class of analyses. So that kind of leads into the question you asked. The most fun part is the other aspect that I haven't talked about too much, which is that the naturalistic data sets. So in theory, Neuroscout could be applied to any BIDS compliant data set because, you know, you can query it, you can find out what the trials are, you know, all the variables. Um, but Again, it's still somewhat limited because someone designed an experiment usually to fit a particular hypothesis, right? So it can only have so much flexibility. But naturalistic data sets have a lot more flexibility because it's just people watching like a very rich stimulus. So you could think of many ways to reanalyze that data. So that's the other component of this that we're really focused on is to actually extract new features from those rich stimuli. Um, and this is with a package called Pliers that Talia Arconi has really been the main driver of. Uh, yep. And also an undergrad uh, master student here, Quentin uh, McNamara. 
Uh, and so this is a package for multimodal uh, extraction of features from uh, uh, different media. So you can actually get, for example, automatic face detection. So Google will actually put a box around people's faces and tell you where their face is, uh, how long they were on the screen, how many faces were on the screen. Uh, you can also transcribe the speech into text and then automatically apply uh, you know, some dictionaries that might give you some natural speech statistics. So you can get all sorts of, you know, hundreds, maybe even like a thousand new features on a data set that you didn't have before, and now apply a brand new analysis to a data set that maybe was just sitting there. So that to me is the most fun part, because I think, like I said, this enables a new class of experiment, a new class of, of science, really, that we haven't been able to do, and thanks to this uh, technology, we're able to actually now explore. I love it. I love it. I'm super excited. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to cut too much into um, Kef, uh, Cameron and Guma's time. But can you tell us um, how people would be able to help you on this journey? What What would you sort of appreciate support with? Yeah, and I think it's really quick. Uh, basically, share your data. Like, keep sharing your data, especially if you have naturalistic data, share it. Because I see a lot of papers, and I don't see the data, so share it. Um, and then you get involved with the basic projects. So maybe not necessarily NeuroScout, but pliers, the extraction framework, PyBids, the uh, Python querying framework for uh, bids, any of those basic projects, there's a lot of issues out there. So if you want to contribute to those issues, they're there. That's awesome. That's awesome. And just for everyone who's watching, we are going to, um, well, this video will automatically be archived on YouTube, but we're also going to link to it on the um, OHBM blog in the next, hopefully in the next couple of days. And we'll include some of these links to some of the projects so that it's a nice, easy place to kind of jump in and, and go exploring. Andrew, thank you so, so much for joining us and thank you for talking us through everything. Um, I am going to, oh, hang on, I got it. I've hidden the participants. I didn't mean to do that. I'm going to make Alejandro smaller. I'm going to bring it back to me, maybe. Yeah, there I am. Hashtag technology. But it's only going to be me for about uh, 30 more seconds because I'm only on screen to introduce our next guest, Cameron Craddock. Uh, Cameron, let me make you big on the screen and you're unmuted. And hello. Oh, no, you're muted again. You're back. So that, I think I might have muted myself. There you go. You're here. Hello. Um, hang on. I can see. Let's do this. One, two. Okay. So, Cameron, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, you are involved in lots of different projects, but specifically, you are here on the call today to tell us about Brain Hack Global. Um, go for it. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you for, for creating this excellent opportunity and new platform for, for kind of communicating some of our projects with the OHBM community. Uh, so um, we are endeavoring uh, to create another Brain Hack Global this spring. Um, so, for many of you, uh, you're probably already familiar with Brain Hack or the OHBM Hackathon, but for those of you that are not, the idea behind the Brain Hacks is to bring people together uh, to collaborate um, and to bring, I guess, interdisciplinary uh, people together, researchers together, to collaborate on projects related to brain science. And so, <clears throat> It's been, this model has been going around for about five years now, and it's always been very successful, or has been very successful. But, in, but the, the kind of where we began with Brain Hacks is where we would have these single events, like for example, the one that occurs before OHBM, and people would come from all over the world to attend the hackathon and come and work together. And there was a, um, a bit of maybe irony about that because many of the people, they were coming from these very vibrant and rich communities to uh, uh, an international community in order to collaborate. And, and we were very happy about that, but we also wanted to encourage more collaboration at that regional level. Um, and 
you know, between institutions and even within institutions, between departments and between uh, labs. And so uh, what we wanted to do was create regional brain hacks. So these would be, you know, small events that maybe happen over a day or two at a local university or in a local city and attract the local researchers together um, to learn more about one another, develop relationships, and, and hopefully to accelerate the pace that we perform neuroscience. Uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of consternation about this because people felt like some of the draw of the brain hack events were the fact that some, you know, maybe some notable people would come. Maybe there would be keynotes that were from, you know, some very popular people or, or uh, and so that that would draw people to the events. And a lot of local uh, groups felt like they didn't have enough um, access to, to local resources in order to be able to drive the excitement that might get people to come and to give up, you know, an afternoon or a weekend in order to participate. So we created these ideas of doing very large scale simultaneous hackathons with the goal of bootstrapping these regional events. So the goal is, is by hosting many regional events simultaneously that we'll be able to share content between those events and then that content would drive the excitement that would bring in people from, um, you know, uh, and, and make the regional events uh, successful. So we started this out. This is actually going to be the fourth simultaneous event we've done. We started out, and originally we were worried about time zones, so we restricted it to one or two hours within the East, uh, Eastern time zone. So we had uh, Brain Hack EDT. After that, we went Brain Hack Americas and expanded it from the East Coast to the West Coast. And then after that, we were really encouraged to open up the model to a global level. So last year, here and I can share this. Um, Last year was the very first Brain Hack Global we did, and it was a very exciting event. We had over 35 sites sign up from all over the world. Uh, as you can see here, we had good representation from Asia, uh, from South America, as well as you know maybe the expected um, representation in the U.S. and in Europe. Based on our estimates, over between you know over 800 people, maybe even over a thousand people attended these events, and they worked on projects that varied from just doing um, you know kind of lightning talks to tell people about their research and to get people to to give them feedback to you know projects, distributed projects where people are in lo different locations that were working together to build a, a software tool. Um, or to perform an analysis. Um, so a, a, a very broad range of things were actually accomplished during this. And due to the popular demand of that, we decided to host a Brain Hack Global um, this spring in 2018. And so right now, we're still trying to pick the, the, the date for it. Uh, voting is still open. If you, you go to our webpage, so this is brainhack.org slash global 2018, um, you see that there's a link for a doodle poll, um, and uh, it, it, it says on the webpage that it ends January 31st. It actually ends tomorrow, this Friday. Um, and there's a, a <clears throat> due to a kind of a, a, a scheduling snafu on my part, I actually added a set of dates in here that shouldn't have been included. So April 4th through the 20th, um, should be excluded from this. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. But if you would like to uh, host a local event, please contact me. Uh, the, the information is on the brainhack.org webpage on how to contact me. There's also, we have a, a lot of documentation now on what it takes to host a local event. Uh, most of the time it just needs, you just need access to a room, um, some refreshments and the ability to kind of um, advertise broadly and to encourage people to come. Um, but if you want to host an event, we're encouraging you to please sign up. Just let me know, and we'll try to help you provide the infrastructure in order to get things done. That is so fantastic. Thank you so much. I will say uh, for anyone that's watching that I hosted uh, Brain Hack Global in Cambridge last year, and it was really, really wonderful. It was it was really good fun. Um, we had a mixture. Of, we had. Don't you? Yeah, I do have a blog. What an interesting remember thing to remember. I will find that and we'll put that in the yeah, so that was, blog uh, page. Not only in addition to hosting an event, which we were very happy for, um, the from what I remember, the blog is kind of a first-hand account of what it's like to host your first brain hack. And it's really, um, it's really good. I was going to shout out that um, I know Pierre and Cameron and a few other people have put together really, really great documentation on how to host a brain hack. So if anyone's feeling um, nervous or like they're not going to know enough people or, you know, exactly like you say, that there's not enough sort of star power to bring and, and fill sort of 
I don't know, a sports hall with open science people. I want to really yeah. encourage everyone who's listening to kind of, you know, know even if you just get together in I don't in know what the concept would actually be that would allow you to fill a sports hall with open science people, but that would be a pretty exciting thing. Well, I, it would be amazing. Let's put that on the, the long-term goals. Um, actually, on this note, though, I want to ask you a quick um, clarification. I know you've thought about this a lot. Mm -hmm. So some people hear hackathon, and they mm -hmm. think of either a corporate competitive hackathon where you know everyone turns up and they've got their teams already and they're gonna like get to the finish line and, and win a prize. Um, or they think of you know needing to have really quite high level computer science and computer programming experience. Um, I don't think that's what a brain hack is all about. Would you like to no, it definitely isn't. And probably one of the, the worst decisions that have been made uh, since we kind of envisioned Brain Hack back uh, five years ago is with the, the, the hackathon aspect of it. And it, um, it, it's not meant to be very literal. And, you know, so generally what I tell people is that, you know, although whatever you do at the Brain Hack is likely to use a computer, it is not necessarily computer programming. Uh, you don't necessarily have you don't have to be an expert in computer programming or a computer scientist or anything to get something out of brain hack. There's um, but one thing that we have noticed is is it's a great opportunity for some people who are you know um, less sophisticated computationally to interact with people who are and to build bridges. Uh, to those who are. We've also started an ed educational regime. We call it Brain Hack 101. Um, to try to teach some of the basic co computational skills that benefit people. Um, but really, as I said before, this is about bringing brain researchers together from a variety. We've had artists who have come and had very successful uh, turnouts to that. Um, so it's, it's, it's meant for everybody. If you find, you know, locally, the, the one thing that's necessary, um, I believe, is, is the ability to, to talk to people to, to find out what their interests are and try to map that onto your own interests to, to begin sort of figuring out what you can do and how you can take advantage of the local resources. And locally, the person who usually is the best at helping you do that is the, the organizer who can bring you in and say, this is, you know, talk, go talk to this person, go talk to Christy, she knows everything there is about genetics and, and brain imaging data, um, uh, something of that nature to kind of help people map it out. Um, the other thing I'd like to address is the competition thing. And one of the things that, that, that we have not had at Brain Hacks, and, and I try to, I, I've tried to ban from Brain Hack events, is the notion of having a competition. Uh, many hackathons, and the, uh, the original OHBM uh, hackathon, have these uh, organizing competitions that they're there to drive the interest. But we don't want people to compete with one another, we want people to collaborate with another. So in general, we say collaboration, not competition. So whereas we've started developing thematic brain hacks that have more of a core kind of um, theme to them so that it can help people understand more what's going to happen at the event, those are not arranged around competitions. They may be arranged around large-scale projects that we want people to, to collaborate on, but we, we strongly uh, uh, we try to make it more about competition or less about competition, more about collaboration. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much for uh, telling us about that. Uh, I'm going to just take one minute. Uh, Gilma, can you hear it? Can you hear us? You can hear us, but we can't hear you. That is such a shame. Um, we have some folks in the background who are just trying to um, fix some tech sort of problems at the moment. But I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you one more question, um, Cameron, which is, I know you already gave sort of the, the history of, of kind of brain hack and how it relates to OHBM and, and the, you know, the sort of the distributed, but at the same time, hackathons, mm -hmm. but what's your sort of personal entry into open science and these collaborative, um, let's not use the word hackathons, but these, these collaborative uh, learning events, what, what sort of made you particularly want to put all the work into this? Uh, 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 one sec, one sec. I think we can. I think we <laughs> we can hear you, but just you know, um, I, I, close, it, close the computer good... and then turn on your phone. Sorry, everyone. This is live. This yeah, is the so, first time. 
but Cameron. So there's probably several ways that I could actually answer that question. And the, um, I, I think probably the most succinct way is to say, you know, from my own background, I'm an electrical engineer. And so I entered into learning, when I entered into neuroscience, uh, there were a lot of skills that I had, computational skills that others didn't have, and I could definitely help them with those. But also I lacked <laughs> a lot of knowledge about brains, of brain anatomy, brain function, all of those things. And I kind of desperately wanted to learn those things. And so I actively pursued collaborations with people like, um, you know, Daniel Margulies, Pierre Bellec, uh, Martin Menes, um, I, I'm trying to name uh, some, of the, some of the original people, Claire Kelly, that were involved in all these things, and um, so that I could learn from them and, and try to improve my sort of uh, neuroscience capabilities in that. But then also, you know, kind of the thing that I had to exchange with them was my own expertise when it comes to, you know, computers and algorithms and methods and things. And, and I kind of thought that that was, I, I sort of see that as where we need to be in, in the future in this field. Field. You know, uh, one of the things that uh, I really liked about what Alejandro says is, and, and, and what you said is, is, so now we're in a situation where we, we don't need to spend as much time or effort in collecting data. So there's people can, who can spend all of their time just kind of thinking about data and thinking about new analyses. I mean, when I started, I, it, it took me three years to collect the data set, and I was a methods guy, right? Why do you need to collect data for three years in order to do machining learning on the data? Um, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense. And so now I'm, I'm really happy that there, there are a lot of these resources out there and that are becoming more increasingly available. And the goal of the open sciences is sort of to create a more collegial uh, environment amongst um, people in our field and to try to really focus in on and um, support and help develop this interdisciplinary uh, collaboration amongst people. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, you know what? We can see the, the ceiling, and I think we can hear you. Hi. Can you say? Ah, oh, look. Thank you, Cameron, so much. You're I don't want to go to, we're going to go a little bit over, which is kind of what I promised that we would not do. But I am really glad that we managed to overcome some of our um, tech challenges. And hopefully, Julia, we're going to switch to you. There's a great uh, picture of you right now. But you were <laughs> on the call to tell us about um, Meg Bids. And we sort of heard about Bids a little bit from Alejandro talking about how NeuroScout sits on top of Bids. Um, but maybe you can tell us about how you're trying to link it up with MEG. OK. 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 No, no. So. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Hi, can yes. you hear me now? Yes, 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 oh. we can. Sorry. Go oh, for it. Perfect. So, um, we have been working on the extension of the bits for MEG. As you may be familiar with, uh, bits. Uh, uh, this standard for organizing data, describing and sharing MEG neuroimaging data. So it has a, a, it benefits from all the experience that the BITS team had, and we have just extended for MEG. So sorry, I'm muted. Um, one of the goals of BIDS is to standardize how everyone names their files, um, which means that probably everybody has their opinion about how to name those files. Am I, can I come back? Uh, someone on the screen tell me if you can yes. hear me. Yeah. OK, awesome. Sorry. So um, how? Who else are you working with to um, come up with this MEG standard? We have, we have collaborated with uh, uh, many labs around the world and mainly with uh, a, a lot of people that is developing software because we think that the uh, MEGBIT standard will be 
in its full pot potential if all the toolboxes that are mainly used for analyzing MEG data incorporate these standards. So we've contacted with people uh, from Brainstorm, like Francois Tadel, who is also at the who was also at the Manai with Sylvain Bayer. Uh, with Robert Ostenbel and Germatais, the many people, Alexander Granfor and Mainak and SPM, Vladimir Litvak. So all these people uh, joined together and, and we kind of organized what were the need we should focus on. And, and how and how easy is that? So I, you know, I've I've written as some some papers, for example, with a couple of people, with three, with four, and then, you know, with a lot more people, and it becomes pretty complex. I mean, I feel like this is an area of uh, understanding of human brain mapping that we need to pay attention to a lot of different connections. And one of the things that I'm really impressed with is the number of people that are contributing to building up these standards. Um, what have you found works well for getting everyone to share their opinions? Well, uh, I don't know. I think the way I share document and put everyone from time to time doing it's, I think it works very well. And people uh, know each other from, from in the past. So, and new people only because me, I, I think I'm the youngest. So, uh, but uh, I think uh, like a shared document, people's opinions is good enough for people to join. And we are also that willing to have a standard, a standard that um, is like a dream for us because in MRI at least you have something like DICOM and there's not something similar for MEG. Every there's some uh, different so, uh, vendors of systems, and every system uses their own way of organizing data. So it's a mess when you have to compare them. That is awesome. I did not know that you didn't have a like something like a DICOM. So um, I guess one of the things that makes your life a little bit easier is that everyone's like, yes. We need this. Yes, we need at this last. So <laughs> that's, yes. That's absolutely amazing. Yes. Um, the, what? So that's, I mean, I think that's like a really, really clear problem that needs to be solved. And I think that having everyone be able to contribute and everyone be able to join this Google Doc and be able to kind of learn and ask questions and, and shape this standard as it goes forward is really, really wonderful. Um, what do you find most fun about working on this? I Sometimes when I think about bids, I think that it's the most boring project, but that has like the most incredible potential to make our lives so much easier and so much more exciting. You know, like a lot of the stuff that Alejandro was talking about. What do you, what do you find most sort of fun to work on? Um, for example, I work with the brainstorm team and we have developed a, a, a function that imports all the bits data into brainstorm and organize it. So whenever I click that button and I see everything like shoo, going so fast for me, it's like, yes, this is well, way we make it. And I love it. I love it. It's so the potential to use open because uh, being open uh, grows so fast. For example, at the beginning, uh, this project started because we were planning to organize the data from Omega, the Open Mega Archive, which is the first open repository fully dedicated to me, to MEG. So we were planning how to organize the data. There were many suggestions, and Jeremy is always very fan of these things. Uh, said okay we uh, put some json files and we were trying to do like a kind of own and then chris contacted us and we said oh that's exactly what we need and that's awesome i'm so yes. I'm, I'm so so glad i am looking at the time and i want to make sure that everyone has time to go back to all of their various um 
meetings and everything else that they have going on today. I personally am staying at my sister's house. And so um, I want to go and play with my uh, five-year-old niece. <laughs> and um, I'm going to, I'm just going to mute you. I'm going to just repeat uh, again, the fact that we are going to hold, we're going to, um, put a bunch of links into a blog post on the OHBM blog along with this video. So if you were watching or if you're watching um, after the fact and you want to share it with anyone, we would love that. This, you don't know this because it's the 1st of February, but this is the January demo call. So this is um, the one that was supposed to be last week, but I had concert tickets and so we moved it by one week. But there will be a February demo call. They're always going to be on the last uh, Thursday of the month. And we already have it scheduled in for the end of February. And we've got three amazing guests um, who are going to talk about a bunch of different projects. If you would like to either nominate yourself, if you work on a project and you would like to um, tell people about it and tell the OHBM community um, about what you're doing, you can either send me an email or you can go to our GitHub repository and we have an issue open there and you can comment. You can also nominate someone else who's doing really great work and we'll reach out to them and see if they want to take part. Um, I want to thank the whole of the um, OHBM Open Science Special Interest Group. I sit on a decent number of committees and this is absolutely by far the most efficient and effective and um, fun uh, sort of group of people that I have ever had monthly meetings with and I'm really, really delighted to be able to work with them. I want to thank Elizabeth Dupre, who has been uh, on this call, and uh, but but actually moderating the chat and sort of helping us out in the background, and she's done a huge amount of work to help me get this sorted. I want to thank uh, Joanne and Stephanie at OHBM, who've helped promote this event, and then mostly, and we'll do a, a sort of silent round of applause with like hands in the air. Um, I want to thank so, so much our first three guests. So Alejandro, Cameron and Guillermo, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for watching. Woo! Thanks. Bye.